Institute of World Politics and the Kostiuszko Chair, which is a part of the Institute. My name is Pavel Sterna. I'm a researcher uh, with the Kostiuszko Chair. And I will be introducing the speakers today as well as giving you a little bit of a historical introduction to the region at large. Um, we'll be talking about the non-kinetic warfare in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Um, and we will have two speakers. Uh, the first speaker, uh, Mr. Vahan Milanian, Dr. Milanian, will be, uh, will be speaking to us via uh, recorded Skype video uh, because of a scheduling issue, um, after which we'll have uh, Mr. Vian Khagatian. Um, Dr. Milanian is a recognized expert on Armenian foreign policy, conflict resolution, and regional security with a focus on the FSU territory and the Middle East. FSU is in his former Soviet Union. He serves as the chairman of the Political Developments, Developments Research Center, PDRC, a think tank based in Yerevan, Armenia. Vector Dilanyan is the author of numerous articles published in popular media and professional publications and a frequent speaker around the country and abroad. Uh, Mr. Agatian is vice chairman of PDRC Think Tank, and, and as far as his education, he attended Webster University, where he doubled major in international relations and international business, and graduated in the spring of 2010. Uh, he spent the semester studying in Vienna, Austria, where, where he also attended OPEC and OSCE workshops. In 2013, he graduated from the Institute of World Politics, where studies focused, focused on national security, the geopolitics of energy. He wrote his honors thesis on the geopolitics of energy in the South Caucasus. Um, now, uh, everyone has received, when, they, when you were arriving, everyone has received a pen and a question submission form. So as uh, the speaker is lecturing, if you have any questions, you can go ahead and jot them down, uh, fill, out the uh, fill out the form, and once the speaker concludes, you can go ahead and pass, uh, pass forward uh, the, your questions. Uh, we'll have a short break, about three minutes, and because we have a, a full, full audience here, and we only have a limited period of time, to field questions, we'll choose uh, three or four questions from the batch uh, to answer. Um, and I would ask that your questions be short, to the point, and uh, no, co no, no prolonged commentary, please. Uh, and if anyone still needs one, I can hear if you could raise the question first. So only questions, and we'll ask that even though Issue, the issue is, is rather controversial and there's a conflict in the region. I ask everyone to please remain uh, uh, civil. Um, otherwise, we'll, be, we'll have to ask, we'll ask, we have to ask anyone who's not civil to leave, unfortunately. Um, now, as far as the history, this is a very region with a lot of history. Uh, there has been some sort of Armenian or Proto-Armenian kingdom in the region uh, for quite a long time, perhaps even 5,000 years. And in the neighboring regions, we have people that there have been uh, polities and states uh, such as the Medes, the Persians, uh, the Caucasian Albanians, the Babylonians, the Assyrians. And it's a very long list. But there's a lot of history here, and that is why history is so important to this region. Uh, one, th one thing that we have to remember also about the Armenia and Azerbaijan region is that it has been basically a region in between larger powers that have been vying and contending for territory and influence. So, the smaller regional states, uh, including Armenia, have to learn to balance between these states. So, for example, you have two superpowers uh, for centuries, such as Rome on the one hand, and then Byzantium, and on the other hand, Persia, Iran, constantly uh, fighting for this region. And, for example, Armenia often have to choose uh, which, side, uh, which side to ally itself with. 
have to the first Christian state, Armenia was the first Christian state in this region, that's another thing to remember, about 300 AD, soon afterwards Georgia also uh, converted to Christianity, and then the Roman Empire. So religion is also the key here, Christian religion. Um, about in the 7th century, 7th, 8th centuries, you had Arab Muslim invasions, which imposed Islam on the region. Uh, and even two centuries, the, the, of course, you have to remember there was a lot of resistance to Islam. Of course, Azerbaijan is not Muslim, Armenia retained Christianity. Uh, in those days, there was still quite a bit of Zoroast uh, the Zoroastrian faith, Iranic Zoroastrian faith in the region, especially in Azerbaijan. So, for example, two centuries after the Arab invasion, you had the rebellion of Bobak Haramdin. Uh, against the Arab Muslim occupation uh, in favor of uh, Iranian Zoroastrian identity independence. Uh, then 11th, 12th century, you had the invasions and migrations of Turkic peoples from Central Asia into this region. And they, of course, they, they, first they came as slave soldiers and eventually, because they were the mercenaries in the Muslim armies, they had the power, they knew they had the power, so they eventually formed a giant state called the Seljuk Turkic State, which controlled pretty much everything from Central Asia all the way to Anatolia, to modern day Turkey, and the Holy Land. Uh, in, the region, in the region such as uh, Azerbaijan, modern day Azerbaijan, you had beginnings of Turkic settlement. Uh, and of course, after, soon afterwards, the Mongols invaded and destroyed and decimated the region. Now, in the 16th, 17th century, you had the rebirth of the Persian Empire, and you had, the, at the same time, the rise of the Ottoman Turkish Sultanate, and again, uh, the Cauc uh, Caucasus region, including Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, became a battlefield between these two superpowers, one Sunni, the other Shia. Um, constantly contending and vying for control of it. Uh, and again, you have populations being resettled. So, for example, Shah Ismail Safavi of Iran, around the year 1600 or so, um, took the population of the city of Julfa, which is now the Nahichevan autonomous region of Azerbaijan. Uh, it was an Armenian population ethnically at the time. And he resettled them to Esfahan, which was then the capital of Safavi, Persia, and created a whole uh, district for the Armenians called Jurfa there. That's, so that's another example, a window into what was occurring in this region at the time. Um, of course, eventually Russia shows up in their region. Russia begins expanding. Around the 19th century, it begins pushing the Turks and the Persians out of the Caucasus. Um, and, of course, the, Arme the Armenians were most happy to see the Russians come in because, one, common Eastern, uh, Eastern Christian denominations, and, two, uh, the Armenians found the Russians preferable to uh, the dini status that they had under the Muslim rulers. Uh, the Georgians, even though they were Christian, were not so happy to see the Russians because uh, 1783, Georgia asked for Russian protection, and Russian history being what it is, Russia understood that as a pretext to simply rule over Georgia. Um, Azerbaijan, because it was Muslim, was not a, the Azeri Turks were not as happy to see the Russians either. Um, so here already you have you have the roots of, of conflict already in the early 18th century. Then, probably the biggest obstacle to peace in the region were the uh, Turkish Ottoman massacres and even the, of the various Christian populations, Armenians, Greeks, uh, and even the Assyrians. So you have the Armenian Genocide, approximately minimum 600,000 to maximum 1.5 million people were killed at this time. Uh, fortunately, Turkey still denies that this happened. 
to the disple great displeasure of the Armenians. Um, so when the so now when Russia fell apart as a result of pressure during World War One, the empire fragmented along ethnic lines, including Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, all these nationalities now saw this as an opportunity to create their own independent states. Um, so you had an Azeri Republic, you had an Armenian Republic led by the Dashnaks, which were the pro-independence National Socialist Revolutionaries uh, who, f who f were fighting uh, against the Turks. Um, but the Soviets eventually overpowered the anti-communist resistance within Russia and reclaimed the territory, first to conquer Azerbaijan, then Armenia, destroying the Dashnak Republic, and then Georgia. And of course, then came the Red Terror executions and all the great and fun things associated with communist rule. And with that, I'll leave it up to Mr. Thank Latin. you, Pablo, yeah, for that overview. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Uh, Start off with the video that our, our chairman, Dr. Dilanyan, recorded. Unfortunately, like Pablo said, we had hoped to do a Skype live uh, type of telecon uh, teleconferencing thing, but uh, scheduling issues uh, got in the way. So. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get Vahan uh, to make a, a good recording, kind of giving an overview of what the talk will focus on, as well as uh, some uh, editorial pieces uh, that uh, you know he would have brought into the discussion had, again, had he been here on Skype. Dear colleagues, it's a particular honor for me to address this event. Thank you for the opportunity and I would like to express my gratitude to the founder and president of IWP, Dr. John Lensowski, and a special thanks to the Kaskiosku Chair of Polish Studies at IWP and its holder, Dr. Marek Jan Czedokovic. Due to our multidimensional network, people in my country and the broader region are aware of your academic analytic institution and hold it in a positive light. I'm sure that such events provide new perspectives for analysis of many international political issues by creating a vitally important platform and a dialogue bridge for the analytic community. Today, my colleague and I will talk about various dimensions of known kinetic warfare. I would highlight the primacy of information in explaining the current state of conflicts in different parts of the world, at least taking into consideration the fact that postmodern society is flooded by information, which transcends state boundaries, cultures, and different types of identity. The recent escalations over the Crimean Peninsula have once again directed our focus to the issues of frozen conflicts, nationalism, and information warfare in the Eurasian territory. Unlike the velvet dissolution of Czechoslovakia, the collapse of Yugoslavia and the Soviet Union brought up several separatist movements and ethnic territorial conflicts. Conflict risks in Tatarstan, Bashkortostan, Chechnya, Nagorno-Karabakh, South Ossetia, Abkhazia, and Transnistria broke out in the former Soviet Union. Attempts toward creating artificial status quo in these regions came to an end with the Russian-Georgian War in August 2008, which has brought about new urgency in the analysis of non-kinetic warfare in the region. Given the political solutions of the Abkhazian and South Ossetian conflicts, security threats were largely linked to another frozen conflict, Nagorno-Karabakh. The transformation of the military leadership into the new political elite and the post-Cold War marginalization of political regimes have set populism and propaganda on the front line, thus misleading society's will toward conflict resolution. The formation picture, as well as the spread of violence and terror attacks around the world, showed not so much the lack of the international community will on establishing peace, but the lack of new mechanisms altered by current threats in the information era. The factor of information has been underrated in the conflict studies in our politically dynamic times, yet there are specific practices of information in the context of action, such as in the Nagorno-Karabakh case, a protracted conflict that is considered as the next flashpoint in the, next, in the region. The non-kinetic warfare here is not associated with the model of modernized soft power as what Sun Tzu called the ECMO skill, but serves as an old combination of hatred propaganda, racism, and murder promotion. These features have never been so intertwined in a country as they are today in Azerbaijan. What does it mean to give a hero's welcome to an extradited Azerbaijani murderer who during a NATO training seminar hacked to death sleeping fellow soldier with an axe solely because he was Armenian? And what does it mean to give this murderer an official pardon, grant him the rank of major, a new apartment, and pay off his debts? This is Azerbaijan. The president of Fiji also announces that a country such as Armenia must not exist. Combined with warlike rhetoric, these kinds of statements and the aforementioned terrible steps create an information atmosphere of armenophobia and hate. 
that if the youth in Armenia and the Empire determine their career paths through having good education, then what are the use in Azerbaijan to think if they see a murderer is given a hero's welcome, a new title and the high state support? Similar racism was advocated in the Third Reich during the 1930s and 40s, and we saw where that anti-Jewish propaganda led. The destructive position of Azerbaijan not only harms the conflict resolution peace process mediated by the OSCE MIS group co-chairman, but also creates obstacles against converging approaches and developing the society's will toward finding a solution, since the foreign state information policy generates an imagined war-prone community and an attendant information-based identity. Despite the transformation of information flows and the rising availability of the internet and social networking sites, the primacy of the policy elite is recognizable in determining the internal and external channels of information flows, since states are still governing those channels in their mandated territories. The best example is Azerbaijan, where according to a U.S. State Department research report, the use of torture and other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment is directed toward those striving to exercise their God-given rights to freedom of expression. Indeed, the factor of the elite's perception of international relations and conflict affects the information policy, which in turn affects the public's behavioral perceptions and intentions toward the conflict. Azerbaijani President Ilham Aliyev's aging advisors, as well as his emotional character itself, might have formed the concept of information-based mobilization for both domestic, political, and war resumption purposes. The essence of this concept is the following. Given the absence of alternative channels of information and the preeminence of closed information culture developed by warlike leadership, the mobilization would be more effective than the one in an atomized democracy. This policy implicates another future, which is portraying the country and the people as a victim to the international community via information flows that's attempting to develop a moral high ground for another war against Nagorno-Karabakh. By misrepresenting the Khojali events, a self-inflicted wound against its own population, Baku's regime tries to hide the responsibility for the Armenian massacres in Sumgait, February 1988, Kirovabad, November 1988, Baku, January 1990, and Maraga, April 1992, all of them condemned by the European Parliament, the U.S. Senate, and other organizations. A fresh example, last month an Azerbaijani family asked Armenian authorities for political asylum due to the continuous persecution by Azerbaijani security services of the husband because he is married to an ethnic Armenian. These non-kinetic policies have practical implications and consequences for the population in terms of developing intolerant, racist, and war-prone behavior. My ultimate concern is that the irrational facets of the advocated hatred culture in Azerbaijan serve as the basis for the development of a pathological cruelty. The striking example was the man with an ox, which is one of the roots of terrorism. Recent disclosures of terrorists of Azerbaijani nationality in Syria's civil war serve as an additional proof of this argument. Meanwhile, another dimension of my concern is associated with the possibility of developing grassroots jihadists in Azerbaijan. Terrorists who don't necessarily have direct contacts with terrorist organizations, such as Al-Qaeda, but share the ideology. They are decentralized and we are not as experienced in dealing with them. Given the growing risk of terrorism and having a memory of dealing with terrorism, the Armenian government has paid special attention to the issue through getting effectively involved in various NATO operations in Afghanistan, U.S.-led missions in Iraq, and hope soon in Lebanon through the U.N. Although Armenia may not register as a high-profile target, this Christian country is in a conflict with Azerbaijan, backed by the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which constantly criticizes Armenia. In the 1990s, it didn't proclaim jihad against Armenia only due to the efforts of Iran. But the Armenian forces had to deal firsthand with the Afghan Mujahideen fighting on the side of Azerbaijan during the Karabakh War. That's where the institutional memory of the birth of terrorists in Azerbaijan comes from. And last of all, the mentioned information policy of the Baku regime affects the overall stability and security in the region, a vitally important fact when considering energy resources security. Before and during conflict settlement meetings, Azerbaijani troops implement military diversions on the borderline. Such actions occur also during the OSCE borderline monitoring missions. Often the kindergartens and medical personal vehicles carrying the symbol of International Red Cross are targeted by Azerbaijani bullets. In a sense, these are psychological games aimed at intimidating. The mob above mentioned indicates also that Azerbaijan cynically violates the humanitarian principles affirmed in the Geneva Conventions and outlined in various high-level meetings basics on a comprehensive peace settlement based on the Helsinki Final Act principle of refraining from the threat or use of force. However, the international community, and namely the OEC, have been reluctant to openly condemn such behavior aimed at creating a war-prone information atmosphere. The co-chairman's policy of false parity or pampering of Azerbaijan adds meat or substance to the so-called non-kinetic warfare of the Azerbaijani side. 
just as the same Afghan Mujahideen supported by the U.S. during the Soviet war in Afghanistan, promoting their jihad against atheist communists, and then a decade later struck the U.S. on 9-11. Similarly, the currently supported elements may become authors of new terror attacks. In conclusion, I would like to communicate to you a precious message from our region, which is a conflict zone, that the people both in Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan, as well as in Armenia, lead a proactive stance from the international community in regards to this situation. The politically-minded community, through promoting or influencing more sound public policies, can create the basis of a paradigm that is aimed at dissolving the government-directed war prompt society formation and replacing it with lasting peace in the wider region. Thank you for your attention. So. As Dr. Dilanyan outlined in, uh, in the video, uh, basically uh, the, the kinetic aspect of the war is more familiar to most people. It's happened, it's in the past for now. The non-kinetic is what's come to the forefront. Uh, he cited several examples, which I will be talking about uh, during uh, the PowerPoint presentation uh, more in depth. But in generally, the, the most dynamic aspect of the conflict right now between uh, Nagorno-Karabakh and Armenia on the one side and Azerbaijan on the other is the non-cadetic and we'll get into specifically what we mean by non-cadetic. But before we do, just a quick overview. Powell gave a, a longer historical overview of the region uh, because many of you are probably not familiar with the Caucasus region uh, and it's important, as Pavel said, history is key uh, for this region, if not any, if not more so than in, in other regions of the world. Um, I'm going to start with an overview of after the Bolsheviks take, take power. So, Karabakh and Nakhichevan were placed inside Azerbaijan by Stalin, who was the Commissar of Nationalities. Now, both these regions had a mixed population, but the majority were Armenian. And historically, uh, they were both part of uh, ancient Armenian kingdoms. Uh, throughout the centuries, as, uh, as Turkic tribes moved in, you know, they settled and they formed communities there as well. The issue with these two specific territories was more so than any other territories were the two sides, the Azerbaijani and the Armenian sides, both wanted it within their respective uh, Soviet Socialist Republics. Originally, they were going to place it in Armenia. However, Stalin and uh, the Bolsheviks thought, well, Turkey is the larger goal. To appease Turkey, let's give the, these territories or let's place them inside Azerbaijan. And hence, that decision was made. And as you can see, in 23, it officially becomes an autonomous region, uh, but still it was uh, both regions at this time in the 20s and 30s, and Nakhchivan up until almost the 60s had a, a, lar a majority Armenian population. Uh, what, troubled, um, what troubled the Armenians in this region, and Nakhchivan is a prime example, is the Azerification policy that took place. Essentially, uh, Armenians were in one way or another, either overtly or covertly, uh, encouraged, let's, let's use that word, to uh, move out or to adopt uh, Azeri customs. So in, in one sense this is a mini form of, uh, within, a, within a state, it's a, it's a mini form of cultural imperialism in the sense that one ethnic group uh, wanted to dominate its, its priorities, its, uh, its customs, its culture over the other. Uh, we come to the 80s uh, with Perestroika and Glasnost. Uh, all these tensions that had been under the surface that the communists had uh, more or less kept a tight lid on for several decades finally uh, were no, could, no, could no longer be maintained when this policy of Gorbachev of more freedom and, uh, and expression and so on more economic freedom came to the forefront. Uh, Armenians decided that it was time for them to rejoin the Armenian SSR um, and that kind of is the beginning of the current stage of the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. Here's a few maps just to show you the, the region that we're talking about. Again, some of you are not as familiar. That's why uh, you know, I think these will be helpful. Um, so it's pretty clearly outlined the different territories. Uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, specifically as the NKAO existed, is more or less territory right there. Uh, and the different shaded areas are the parts that are, are surrounding it and Armenian uh, forces uh, took control of during the course of the war as uh, both buffer zones and as uh, if you get deeper into Ar Armenian history as part of a wider region called uh, Artsakh, which we'll, we'll talk about later on into, uh, into the presentation. Here's another one, just a closer uh, of the, of the Nagorno-Karabakh area. Uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's not a large area, uh, but it's, uh, it's the next uh, flashpoint, as Dr. Dilanyan pointed out, or potential flashpoint. 
Uh, this is just more to show you. I'm not going to get too much into the energy aspect of it because that's not what the talk is, is really about. But these are the various pipelines that crisscross it. Uh, uh, most of you are well aware that Azerbaijan is a uh, energy exporter, natural gas mostly, but also oil. Um, the BTC pipeline, which is one that probably, if, if any of you have heard of any of these pipelines, that's the one um, that was linked with the so-called uh, deal of the century in the late 90s when former Azerbaijani President Haider Aliyev uh, signed uh, an agreement with several Western oil firms, chiefly BP, to export uh, Azeri crude to uh, the European and global markets. Uh, it's, the red, uh, it's the red line, as you can see. Uh, the reason I wanted to point it out specifically for this talk is it runs very, very close along with uh, uh, the gas pipeline, Baku Erzurum, to the conflict zone uh, in and around uh, Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, therefore, it's always brought up that it's a potential um, target for uh, specifically the forces of Nagorno-Karabakh should uh, Azerbaijan relaunch uh, hostilities. So getting back to the overview, in 87, the Karabakh Armenians sent a petition to Moscow essentially asking to rejoin uh, the Armenian Soviet Socialist Republic. Um, this, uh, this was not favored by Moscow because uh, not only in the Caucasus, but in the wider Soviet Union, you know, uh, Central Asia is another great example, uh, the Bolsheviks followed a, a policy of essentially divide and rule. So if they agreed to this, it would open a Pandora's box of other regions uh, wanting the same thing. So that, along with some other reasons, they decided it's better not to, uh, not to agree with uh, or not to allow this to happen. Uh, mass demonstrations began in Yerevan, the capital of Armenia, because of obviously solidarity issues. And again, we're, I brought up perestroika, glasnost. Uh, Armenians now, for the first time in decades, uh, felt empowered to uh, express their uh, national aspirations something that they had not been allowed to do under uh, the communist regime beforehand. This resulted in uh, anti-Armenian pogroms that took place in Sumgai, just outside of uh, Baku. And I like to say that uh, more or less this was, uh, th these pogroms that took place were what uh, sealed the deal. After this, it could never go back to being business as usual in the sense of uh, now animosity had officially been, uh, blood had been spilled, animosity had officially been sown between the two peoples, uh, Azerbaijanis and Armenians. Um, again, uh, more anti-Armenian pogroms took place in Baku, um, and later uh, that year, uh, Baku abolished the status of the Nagorno-Karabakh Autonomous Oblias. Now, I should mention that as, a, as an autonomous oblast, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh was responsible first and foremost to Moscow, not to Baku. That's true of all uh, autonomous uh, oblasts in the Soviet Union. The region that they were given broad autonomy was because, uh, again, there was uh, ethnic issues in the sense of many of the, of the population were uh, ethnic Armenian. It was uh, over 70% at this period. Uh, so the Soviets, the policy was all right, you don't like being a part of this country, but at least you don't have to answer them directly. You are, you're answering to Moscow. So that way it was kind of a, a guarantee mechanism that they used. Uh, this didn't sit well with the Arabakh Armenians who declared uh, independent status. Uh, again, we use the, the Armenian name Artsakh there, which is uh, now more commonly used uh, among Armenians than, than the, uh, the Turkic uh, uh, Iranic name of Arabakh. Actually, I should mention that Pavel talked earlier about the different empires. So Gara is black in Turkish, in all Turkic languages actually, and Bach is garden in, uh, in Middle Persian. So black garden. Uh, so that kind of gives you an idea of the fact that the name is, uh, is a combination of two of the dominant peoples that tried to rule the area. But anyway, uh, the Khojali massacre, which I'll get into more, uh, occurred in, in 92, and that's uh, one of the aspects then where we're talking about the Nakhidetic warfare especially uh, psychological and political warfare that the Azerbaijani side has used to uh, its advantage. The OSCE, at the time the CSE, the Conference uh, for Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, at the same period they decided to take up basically the mandate for negotiating, for coming to some kind of uh, settlement or some kind of solution for the problem. Again, war was, was going on at this time, but it, was, uh, it intensified, especially in the lighter part of 92, 
and uh, 93, and obviously it ended in 94 with the ceasefire in May 12th that Russia helped broker. That Russia helped broker, um, and it's still in effect, so 20 years, uh, which has lasted longer than many observers have, have thought. So it's a good thing. Um, and then we get finally to the mandate for the OSCE, which is more or less the current mandate that exists now. The three states that, that run that, that are the co-chairman countries, are Russia, uh, the United States, and France. And they are the only authorized mediating body to handle this. Sorry, right, what do we mean by non-kinetic warfare? Information, political, psychological. The aims are all the same. You're altering the, your opponents or even a third party's state of mind to be more or less to be uh, either afraid of you, to want to do what you want them to do, or to, uh, to side with you if it's third party with your cause instead of your enemy's cause. So information warfare, to, uh, to get more into detail. This is more the use of purely just uh, not only obviously information, but information technology as well. So internet, uh, websites, all those things are, are used to uh, spread the message, you know, whatever, whatever you want the target audience to receive, you make use of the current technology. Information warfare obviously has existed prior to the advent of the internet, but it's taken on a whole new dimension because now you can reach hundreds of millions of people instantaneously and it's very cheap to set up a website to get your point across and to post more or less whatever you want with little to no fact checking. Um, it involves, as you can see, uh, various things and again it's spreading, it's used in this instance and in most instances to spread often disinformation or mis misinformation or black or gray propaganda. Black propaganda usually uh, entails, you don't know what the source is, the source can be, and that's negative information, the source is often, it appears to be a, uh, a non-interested party, but in reality they're getting fed from uh, a party to the conflict. Uh, gray information, you know where it's coming from, and again, but it's, it's, it's a negative uh, information that's being fed to you. Political warfare is probably more, more well known, it's much more ancient than information warfare and again as you can see it's, it's compelling the opponent to do one's will, um, it's calculated interaction between government and target audience to include another state's government, military and or general population and again ideas, images, words. Uh, you want to convey as much as you can with, you know, whether it's an image or words, you want to get your, your point across and, and it's not just giving purely information, it's obviously information with a slant that hopes to uh, convey your message and your, uh, and your uh, point of view to your target audience. Psychological warfare, this one, I, I decided to take it from the DOD because the United States is, is one of the main countries and it's well known the United States has a very active PSYOPs program. So you, know, you could all, all read uh, what the DOD definition is and I think most countries more or less with very, very uh, few tweaks would agree that this is uh, the essence of psychological warfare. Um, you know, and it's been in use for centuries. World War II is one of the best examples that we have of both sides using psychological warfare, uh, both the Red Army, uh, the, the Nazis, uh, the British and the Americans, so on and so forth. It's, uh, you know, pamphlets, movies, so on and so forth, all of that. So first we're going to touch on Azerbaijan's not kinetic warfare. So Ramos Safarov, uh, give you background on it, and my colleague touched upon it when he was mentioning the individual with the axe who, uh, who was given a hero's welcome in Azerbaijan. So in 2004, NATO uh, held trainings uh, for various countries uh, to come to attend in Budapest. And uh, obviously there were several Armenians, several Azerbaijanis that attended along with other uh, ethnic groups uh, from different countries. Uh, one night, uh, Ramaz Safrov, uh, an Azerbaijani uh, soldier, snuck into the room of an Armenian, Gurgen Markaryan, while he was sleeping and uh, killed him with an axe. He almost severed his head from a body. Uh, he was going to sneak into another Armenian's room, but that Armenian had, uh, had the foresight to close his door, so that was prevented. Uh, suffice to say, uh, he was placed under, Mr. Safrov was placed under arrest by the authorities. He was tried and he was giving a uh, life imprisonment in Hungary. Well, we come to a few years later, to 2012, uh, talk starts to go around that Hungary might extradite him to Azerbaijan. They were getting promises that 
Azerbaijan would honor the life imprisonment. It would just be better, the argument goes, that he serves his uh, term in his home country instead of in a foreign country. Uh, Armenians uh, started protesting and obviously saying, you know, if he goes there, chances are very high that he's not going to serve his term and that it would be uh, an injustice to do something like that. Well, sure enough, and there's allegations that uh, the government in Baku bribed the government in, uh, in uh, Budapest by agreeing to buy bonds, up to three uh, billion euros worth of bonds to release Safarov to, to their custody. So in late August, that's exactly what happened. Safarov gets on a plane to Baku. Immediately he lands, he's given a hero's welcome, he's pardoned, he's promoted, any debts that he had accrued are forgiven, He's given a new flat in downtown Baku, and uh, you know, people are just celebrating the return of a hero. Now, I can understand the concept of a war hero, and I think most of you can as well, but uh, the actions of Mr. Safarov are certainly far from war. It was a peaceful event. It was a training exercise sponsored by NATO, and uh, you talk about you know, stabbing someone in the back or shooting them in the back, packing them to sleep is an even more... Uh, despicable way to go about uh, you know, attacking your enemy, but that's exactly what happened. Uh, so far we haven't heard much from him, he's kind of disappeared. Uh, some sources say that's because uh, the Armenians are looking to assassinate him as a form of revenge. Other sources say it's just, you know, he's out of the spotlight, he kind of brought more damage to the Azerbaijani side than was intended because a lot of world leaders, including uh, President Obama, condemned it and said that it definitely was not helpful to the, the peace process excuse me, the peace process going on, and uh, the story hasn't, yeah, we're almost there, the story hasn't, uh, hasn't quite ended, but for now it's, it's settled. Cyber attacks on Armenian government sites. Again, we're, this, this is going back to information warfare. Very easy to do cyber attacks. I'm sure most of you are familiar with DDoS attacks, denial of service attacks. Basically, you just send a lot of uh, uh, request to a website, you overload its, its, uh, its servers, and then people that actually are trying to access the site can't. That's one form. Another way is to actually deface websites, you know, post uh, nationalistic uh, slogans, nationalistic images, so on and so forth. So this is a common and very cheap tactic that's used, and again, it can be done from anywhere in the world. You just need to have some computer savvy. The Haidar Aliyev Foundation and the Haidar Aliyev statues, uh, which are somewhat interrelated. So the Haidar Aliyev Foundation works to basically spread Azerbaijan's uh, message, its history, its culture, uh, to the world at large. And in line with this, it's also, which, which I'll touch on, it also has been sponsoring uh, events dedicated to the Khojali uh, massacre that was mentioned earlier, and politicizing that issue, and Again, taking it or another route to serve Azerbaijan's national interest, not its purely cultural interest, which when you read the, the mandate of the foundation, just sounds like a cultural organization. But the activities that it does go beyond the cultural realm. The statue, uh, the, the most well-known one, some of you have, uh, might be familiar with it. A few years ago, the government in uh, Azerbaijan decided to renovate uh, the Central Park in Mexico City, one of their, one of their central parks. Uh, and in return, you know, for spending a couple million dollars renovating it, a statue of Haider Aliyev would be placed there along with statues of Gandhi and other prominent world leaders. Sure enough, that's what happened. Mexicans were unaware who this individual was, and when they found out that uh, he was a KGB general, when they found out that he had a less than stellar uh, track record on you know, humanitarian issues, and when they found out that he was certainly no Azerbaijani Gandhi, uh, they protested and they got the city council to remove the statue. But again, this is an example of just soft power, but also a non-kinetic way of getting your history across to uh, a country such as Mexico, which you know, the average Mexican has no idea about this region, its history, its people, any of that. Uh, went about it in a very roundabout way, but it didn't work uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, Mexican citizens who you know, were curious, curious enough to find out who is this individual. All right, this one is a, is a very big issue because it touches upon something much wider than Azerbaijan and it stresses back for uh, several centuries, but the idea of Pan-Turkism is a fairly new idea. 
So the Islamic and Turkic card are used by Azerbaijan. And I say card in the sense that it's done cynically. Azerbaijan uh, is one of the most uh, secular countries, secular Islamic countries. So the whole notion that it's this pious Islamic country is used when it's to its benefit, such as in the OIC, the Organization of Islamic Countries, to uh, portray it as purely the victim in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict and to get the sympathy and the votes of the Islamic world at large. Again, most Muslims the world over are unaware of what this conflict is about and certainly it's not a religious conflict. Armenians and Azerbaijanis did not go to war because one's Christian and one's Muslim. Was that a factor? Yes. Was that a main factor? No. However, the Islamic card when it's used by uh, Baku shows it more often than not as Islamic unity needs to be preserved, uh, Muslim countries need to support us because we're Muslim and that's it. The Turkic card is tied in with that. So its main ally is Turkey and there is a slogan that is often repeated by Azerbaijanis but also by Turks. One nation, two states. Turkey, Azerbaijan, two states, one nation being the wider Turks. Armenians have kind of, and I'll touch on that, I've kind of played upon this notion to their benefit as well to, uh, to, show, the, to show to galvanize the Armenian uh, people to the cause, which I'll mention uh, when, we get, when we get to that point. But essentially, uh, pan-Turkism is the ideology that all Turkic states stretching from the Xinjiang region and uh, the west of China all the way to uh, even some, some sources say the Balkans, but all the way at least to modern uh, western part of Turkey, Anatolia, need to be united in either a direct uh, confederation or federation or some form of uh, polity. And that's, that's the, the notion of the Turkic card and as you can see it's very easily mixed into the Islamic card because the Turkic peoples are also Muslims. Arms race con concessions during negotiations. So Baku, as I mentioned, it's, it's a natural gas and an oil exporter. For uh, about almost a decade now, they've get, been getting several billion dollars uh, from their exports. And they've been using that to beef up their armaments. They've been using that to, uh, uh, to prepare their troops for a possible uh, resurgence uh, or uh, a new attack against Nagorno-Karabakh. And they've also calculated that Armenia can't afford to keep up with the, the arms race. So and essentially, it's, it has two prongs, the economic to bankrupt Armenia, who's, you know, let's say they're trying to keep up with the Azerbaijanis, but also to frighten them psychologically that, well, hey, we can't keep up, so let's, uh, let's make concessions at the negotiation table. Neither have really worked because uh, the Armenians are, get... Uh, discount weapons or even weapons free of charge from the Russian Federation which has a strategic alliance with Armenia and the Russia one of the things that it aims to do in the region is to keep the status quo and how you do that is keeping the balance of forces stable and also uh, Armenians have this has only led to the notion among Armenians which I'll get to of a, of a siege mentality so it's actually feeding into the Armenian notion that uh, we're surrounded we're under attack and you know we need to do whatever we can to defend our borders and our people. So here's the big one that I'm going to focus on more so than I did on the, the other ones and we'll have some images to accompany them as well because uh, this one ties in with something that is very uh, is a very important issue to Armenians all across the world, the issue of the Armenian genocide and this is kind of the Azerbaijani foil or attempt to uh, to equate uh, the Khojali events, which I'll talk about with the Armenian genocide. And it's a, it's a false comparison. Uh, and it's in, it's in line with their efforts in the United States, which as most of you know, our system is built on allowing various lobbying groups, whether they're ethnic or industry or what have you, to have a say in our government, to have a say in the resolutions, to have a say in basically the making of law. So Azerbaijan has taken advantage of that to push through various resolutions in states across the United States to push its agenda of getting Khojale recognized as a genocide. Um, it's been successful in some states recently. It has not been successful. For example, South Dakota, Hawaii, and Wyoming recently turned down a resolution that would have uh, more or less said that Khojale was a genocide and blamed the Armenian side unequivocally for the actions. Um, and the, the think tanks are go along with it. I'm not going to mention any names specifically, but they are located in the D.C. area, as, as you can imagine. 
and again, it feeds into the wider aspect of not only advocating the Khojale uh, issue, but also the wider perceptions management that the Azerbaijani government is trying to implement in the United States specifically. So let's go to some of the images that we have. So here's the great propaganda. We know that these sources, and again, I said with great propaganda, you know who the source is, but it's making the point that something bad happened or whoever did it is bad, so on and so forth. So here we have the same photo. It's been edited, and this, this, the same theme is going to continue. The photos on the right are originals. Photos on the left are edited versions. So here, this supposedly uh, ethnic Azerbaijanis who've been killed by Armenian forces, according to the Azerbaijani narrative. Same picture, but it's the original, but it's from Kosovo. Here's another one. Again. Women, children, supposedly killed uh, in Khojali. Actuality, it's from 1983, an earthquake. Here's an Azerbaijani language article, again talking about the role of children, how they've suffered, how they were killed, so on and so forth by ethnic Armenian forces. Starving Afghan children. And finally, another Azerbaijani language article uh, this is just showing dead men who have been, you know, uh, killed by opposing forces. Again, the blame is put on Armenian forces for inflicting this wound on Azerbaijan. In reality, it took place, uh, it took place uh, in uh, just Hamas fighters that were killed by Israel, so, you know, probably Gaza. So real quickly, before I start on this, I wanted to mention the Khojale events. So the Khojale events are connected with a campaign, the Armenian, and this is, this is, we're going back to the war between Nagorno-Karabakh and Azerbaijan. So the capital of Nagorno-Karabakh, Stepanakir, was being shelled by Azerbaijani forces uh, from various locations. Khojali was one of them. So it was imperative for the Armenian forces to capture this to stop the shelling. So a plan was hatched to, uh, and to move in uh, in February uh, and retake the city. Ten days before the actual attack on the city, Armenians with loudspeakers were broadcasting that if you're a civilian, now's the time to flee. Uh, we will be moving in at some point soon, and that you know we've given you fair warning that essentially vacate, and we're providing a corridor that you can use where we won't shoot, you won't be attacked, you can get back to Azerbaijan proper. Uh, some individuals heeded these warnings and were able to get out of the city. Others did not. Uh, several hundred individuals were killed. Here's where it gets, uh, it gets more, uh, I guess, hazy is the right word to use it. What happened was several hundred individuals are claimed to have been killed. Azerbaijan unequivocally says that these were Armenians that did it, that, and then afterwards Armenians mutilated the bodies. However, there's so many contradictory uh, reports from ethnic Azerbaijani reporters from a, a well-known Czech reporter and other individuals that were involved that were saying that uh, these, these individuals were shot at from two directions, not one, meaning that it could have easily been, and as implied, was a false flag operation carried out by Azerbaijani forces to shift the blame on the Armenians to get the international community support. And also, there was a power struggle going on which fits into the wider false flag narrative. Uh, Mutalibov, the, the president at the time, was under siege uh, various forces, more nationalistic, uh, wanting to ramp up the conflict, uh, angered that the Azerbaijani side was losing the conflict, wanted to uh, take over power. So they thought this would be a perfect way to stage a provocation, blame it on the lack of Mutalibov's leadership, oust him from power, take power, and continue the fight. So this is the narrative more so often that you hear from the Armenian side. And again, there is ample evidence to suggest that this could have very likely happened. Uh, former President uh, Mutalibov himself, who's now living in Moscow, uh, has, has hinted that this was indeed something that was carried out by Azerbaijanis to oust him from power. And that's, uh, again, that's the narrative that you don't hear coming from the Azerbaijani side because it fits into their wider agenda of having a comparison with the Armenian genocide. They want to have their own genocide to create the notion that indeed they are the victims, Armenians are the aggressors, not the other way. Because at the beginning of the conflict, Armenians more often than not in the international press and also within the Soviet Union were seen as 
the victim community more so than the Azerbaijanis. This tactic has, has had some effect in getting various countries, various states, like I said, to recognize the Azerbaijanis as the victims and to recognize uh, a massacre as a genocide or as something else, which in essence it's not. And as I mentioned, the facts around it are still very hazy. It's very politicized and more information hopefully one day will be revealed and we can conclusively say what exactly happened. But the fact is that it was not a genocide and using it as such, again, falls perfectly in line with the uh, Azerbaijani narrative of victimhood at the hands of Armenians. Now finally getting to Karabakh and Armenia's non-kinetic warfare. So the Talish radio broadcasts, as some of you may be well aware, there's various ethnic groups in Azerbaijan. Azerbaijanis are the dominant ethnic group. The vast majority of the citizens of Azerbaijan are ethnic Azerbaijanis. But there is minority groups of Talish and Lezhgins. Uh, about a year and a half ago, a program started that's broadcast out of Nagorno-Karabakh, which targets the Talish-speaking population of Azerbaijan. And essentially, it's the best way I can describe it is it's the equivalent of the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty broadcast during the height of the Cold War from Prague, or I'm sorry, not from Prague, but from Western Europe into Eastern Europe. And basically, it's getting news out in their language. It has cultural stuff as well. You know, they'll play Talish songs, so on and so forth. So it's not purely political in the sense that they're saying, oh, Azerbaijanis are evil or bad or break away from, from them or anything like that. But it, it has the undertones of supporting a resurgence of the Talish identity because, uh, again, to use another uh, Cold War term, as many of you are aware during the Cold War, there's a notion of the captive nations within uh, the Soviet Union. So from the, from the Armenian policy, the Armenian mindset is there are captive nations in Azerbaijan. The Talish and the Lezhgins being the two most well-known uh, ethnic groups and the largest as well, outside of ethnic Azerbaijanis. So that's been something that's going on once a week. Uh, there's been talks to increase it. There's been talks to add a Lezhgin program as well. Um, we'll, see, we'll see where that goes. The use of Armenian terms instead of foreign terms. So I mentioned Artsakh, which was the term that I had in parentheses next to Nagorno-Karabakh. Artsakh was one of the uh, original provinces of the ancient kingdom of Armenia, which more or less corresponds and includes uh, regions surrounding Nagorno-Karabakh. Uh, Armenians have returned to using these ethnic Armenian names uh, for, for two reasons. One is to instill the notion that these regions are Armenian, have been Armenian, will continue being Armenian, and also to get rid of uh, the notion of foreign subjugation, of foreign uh, powers being in control, of foreign entities basically dictating what the Armenian, uh, I guess, uh, vocabulary, what the lexicon should be. So it's very important, this, uh, this specific point, because it, for basically centuries now, a common predominant, and it was reinforced by the genocide theme among Armenians, is the victimhood theme. This is kind of trying to counteract that theme within the Armenian society to say that, in a very subtle way, that you know, we decide our fate, that we're taking it upon us, that we're going to dictate what the name is. I touched on this earlier too with pan-Turkism. So this, that whole notion of uh, one state, or two states, one nation, plays into the, the Armenian narrative very well. The ultimate other for Armenians are Turks. And this, this the genocide culminated in, in creating that notion, but uh, the Turks have a very tense relationship with most of their minority groups, uh, Greeks and Armenians being the most well-known to the international community. Uh, so the Armenian side plays this to its advantage by, for example, when you're talking about Azerbaijanis with, uh, within or among Armenians, oftentimes you won't hear an Armenian say, when he's talking about Azerbaijanis, he won't say Azerbaijan, he'll just say Turk. He doesn't make a difference between Turk from Turkey or from Azerbaijan. So why I, I chose to highlight this uh, uh, Specifically was because, again, it fits into the notion earlier of you know, Armenians being the victims throughout most of their history. And who is the, who is the country that ultimately has victimized the Armenians most? Well, in current, uh, the Armen current frame of the Armenian mind, as far as that's, that uh, situation is concerned, are the Turks. And of course, the genocide is well known. You know, 1.5 million Armenians killed during 1915-1922. But now it's this notion that Azerbaijanis want to continue the genocide that their cousins in Turkey weren't able to complete. And again, it feeds into the siege mentality that Armenia must protect itself at all costs, that Armenia is under attack, 
and that Armenia has enemies on both sides that are intent on continuing a genocide that wasn't finished. And another point uh, in the Armenia's non-kinetic warfare is Armenia, along with uh, the other parties to, to the conflict, does not recognize Nagorno-Karabakh's uh, independence, de jure. Reason being, Armenia is striving to keep to a constructive approach. Negotiations are ongoing, and the hope is that both sides will eventually come to an agreement, and you know, both sides can walk away, and this is the hope, saying, you know, it wasn't so bad. We got kind of what we wanted, they got kind of what they wanted, whatever. That hasn't occurred for 20 years, you know, negotiations have been ongoing. But this is kind of a, uh, a small, you could say, hammer that the Armenians have hanging over the heads of the Azerbaijanis uh, in the sense of, listen, you guys escalate this conflict anymore, or you guys walk away from the peace process, which Azerbaijan uh, has threatened to do, or has threatened to change the, from the OSC Minsk Group co-chairmanship, to the UN or OIC or other organizations which Armenia and Nagorno-Karabakh are totally against, Armenia has said, here's, you know, here's, our, here our, here's our reply to that. We will definitely recognize it. We'll definitely uh, make sure that we protect it at all costs. And that essentially means Armenia will go to war to protect uh, Nagorno-Karabakh's uh, independence. So to wrap up uh, and kind of make some predictions, uh, I, again, I mentioned, and Dr. Duane and I mentioned that in the video that we had, many observers, many analysts say that this is the next flashpoint. Uh, I'm not so sure that necessarily this is absolutely going to be the next flashpoint, although I, I don't think that's a wrong characteristic as well. However, it's the, the party that lost the conflict, Azerbaijan, is the one that rhetorically and that's important to keep in mind, rhetorically, has been making statements and has been more eager, again, rhetorically, to restart conflict. Uh, more often than not, whenever uh, President Aliyev of Azerbaijan, the son of Haider Aliyev, uh, uh, is making a speech, it always, always touches on Nagorno-Karabakh. And usually, it goes something like, it's our territory, uh, we're going to get it back. Right now, we're doing you know, peaceful negotiations, but if that doesn't work, we always have the army at our disposal. More or less, that's, you know, a configuration of that is what you hear in most of the speeches. However, in reality, there's, there isn't going to be in the war in the region unless Baku is a, as close to 100% certain of victory as possible. Why? Because of the oil and gas pipelines that run very close to the conflict zone, and because Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh hold the high ground, so it would literally be an uphill battle for the Azerbaijanis. And because of uh, the certainty that Armenia would get dragged into the war and the uh, other notion that uh, Russia doesn't want a war to happen, it's quite happy with the status quo. It allows it to maintain both countries, uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, and, and Nagorno-Karabakh, and it's more or less its sphere of, of influence, although Armenia is closer to, to Russia than Azerbaijan. But again, it allows them to kind of dictate the policy. War grows out, it's unpredictable. Uh, no one really knows what the consequences are going to be. Turkey may very well get dragged into it, most likely asymmetrically. So it's really a no-win situation. Uh, the other reason that they may start a uh, conflict, Az Azerbaijan may start a conflict, is domestic political situation. So the highlight of this talk, and indeed what we've been, what we've been mentioning, is the psychological factor, the political factor the non-kinetic factor. So if you're constantly telling your, your populace that we're going to get the territory back at any moment, you know, if should we decide we're strong enough to get it back, they can't stop us, so on and so forth, they start to believe what you're feeding them. And in this sense, if a political situation rises, either against uh, Aliyev's rule, because he's not a democratically elected leader, so there's uh, issues with his, uh, his viability staying in power and all that, uh, you can always distract the populace with, you know, starting another war or a foreign policy f uh, adventure. So that's, that's the other possibility that a war could start. Again, not very likely at this point because uh, the opposition in Azerbaijan is not truly unified and they, at this point they don't present a real uh, threat to Aliyev. However, again, it's his own uh, rhetoric that may lead people to kind of push him to egg him on to, uh, to solve this by force. Uh, Russia is, of all the uh, great powers involved in this country, and I mentioned the co-chairman countries, France, United States, Russia, they have the most influence, they have the most say, and as Russia's power, as we've seen with Crimea, as we saw with Georgia, 
and as we're, we will soon see with their plans to establish naval bases in the Caribbean and in the, uh, in the South, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, they're very confident, they're, they're expanding their influence, not just in the, their so-called near abroad, but also in other regions. They're the ones that, if anyone really holds a key to force these parties, and it wouldn't be easy, I'm certainly not saying that it would be easy to force a solution, but Russia really holds the key, Russia can make or break any peace deal. So even if the two sides were to somehow agree to some kind of peace deal, if it was against Russia's national interests, it would not go through. You can say, you know, if France representing the EU might have some power as well, and obviously the United States, but nowhere near the influence that, that Russia has. So when we're discussing the negotiation process, when we're discussing the parties to the conflict outside of the, the, the third parties, now outside of the immediate Armenian Azerbaijani dichotomy, uh, Russia is the first and foremost to look at. You could say it is, in a sense, the alpha and the omega of this conflict when it comes to the great power interests in the Caucasus. Um, and this is a little tongue in cheek, but I do believe a solution will be found but this century, so it could be you know, in a year or it could be in, you know, in 80 years or 50 years or whatever. I don't think that the status quo will remain as the status quo, meaning Nagorno-Karabakh is independent, but it's not recognized by international countries. Something is bound to happen, either peacefully or not, but certainly uh, the political boundaries are fluid, they're always changing, and yeah, it'll, it'll be solved sooner rather than later. So with that said, thank you very much, and yeah. Oh, and uh, again, a special thank you to the IWP and the Kosciuszko Chair uh, for Polish Studies for putting this on. Thank you. All right, let's start with one that at first glance doesn't really appear to have uh, much to do with the, with the presentation. So, I guess I won't read names just because it's not that important, but uh, one of this first question asks, is a conflict going to have impact on balancing the powers in Afghanistan and Iraq? Uh, not so much because the balance of power in those regions are dictated by other forces. However, Azerbaijan is a transit route, or, and still is, for uh, forces being moved out from Afghanistan, NATO forces. So in that sense, its importance to the West will decline once uh, the United States and its allies are outside of Afghanistan. Uh, so in that sense, it affects the balance of power in the Caucasus as far as their options. But the countries that are specifically asked here, Afghanistan and Iraq, no, this conflict doesn't, uh, doesn't affect them that much. Okay. All right, here we have a question. Uh, so, current president of Armenia, Serge Sarkisyan, is quoted in uh, Tom Duvall's book as uh, saying, and here's the quote, uh, Til Khajuli, Azerbaijanis were thinking that we cannot raise our hands to civilians, dot, 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 we did it. Please comment. I read that passage in uh, Black Garden. Uh, I counter that with uh, the first president of Azerbaijan, as I pointed out, said that it was a false flag operation. So here again, as I mentioned, you have two contract contrasting narratives. You have an Azerbaijani who you would think would say, sure, it was the Armenians that did it. And you have an Armenian that's saying, yeah, maybe we did it, you know, but it was payback or something like that. The point being is there's, this issue has been so politicized, there's so much misinformation, disinformation put out there that saying that for it was for sure Armenians that did it, it was for sure Armenians that mutilated the bodies, or saying it was for, for sure a false flag operation, misses the point that we don't have all the key information, and the information that we do have has been so twisted that it's very difficult to make uh, sense of the situation. But it is my personal belief that if it was anything, it was a false flag operation, and that it wasn't Armenians that went out of their way to murder uh, civilians and then mutilate their bodies because uh, during the track record of the conflict, it was more often than not uh, the Azerbaijani side that was engaged in pogroms, engaged in attacks against ethnic civilians, non-combatants, rather than the Armenian side. So it doesn't fit into the wider uh, Armenian narrative, but it certainly does fit into the Azerbaijani narrative. Next question. Do you see any efforts, be it from communicated being from conflicting sides or international community aimed at 
Basing the damage of non or easing the damage of non kinetic warfare, peace initiatives, confidence building uh, measures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, no, I don't see that because uh, for many people, non kinetic warfare, especially uh, just average civilians, not only in this in these countries but the worldwide over, non kinetic warfare is a it's it's they don't know anything about it, they're not aware that it's even taking place more often than not. So the fact that you don't even have it from a grassroots level, this demand to kind of change it. Sure, you have some um, journalists meeting with one another, you have some sporting events, so on and so forth, but that's not enough. The ultimate issue here is, again, uh, active uh, political, psychological information warfare being waged on both sides. Uh, the Azerbaijani side definitely is more active in that regard. And it's in their credit to continue doing that because, like I mentioned earlier, the kinetic war is unlikely to resume unless they know for sure that they're going to win. That's unlikely to change. Therefore, they're going to continue with their policies of, uh, of uh, spreading misinformation, gray propaganda, black propaganda, so on and so forth. And the Armenian side will surely uh, counter that to the best of its uh, ability and so on and so forth. Uh, so no, I'm not, I'm not optimistic on that account. Two more questions. Uh, it seems now Putin is using same methods, uh, capture lands, uh, subjugation, uh, and I want to say humiliation or something like that. Please comment. Um, Putin, you can't really involve him too much in this conflict. It's actually his predecessor that was much more engaged in the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict. I believe it was only 2004, 2005 that uh, President Putin actually even personally took an interest in this conflict, and then he got annoyed. Uh, when the president started arguing as far as uh, diplomats that were there mentioned. Uh, Medvedev was much more active and even he wasn't able to come to uh, some kind of solution. Uh, the, you, the Crimea issue is, is much, 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 much more personal for the Russians for reasons that I think most of you are now well aware with all the information that we've been bombarded with. So it's not really a, a, a good comparison uh, or even a good, uh, or even good to bring up Putin in this discussion because uh, the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict fits into uh, Russia's plans to, again, keep the status quo where it is. So they don't want it hot, and they, you know, they want to keep it as cold as possible. At the same time, they want to remind both sides that, uh, that they can make or break uh, the situation for either of them. So I, I, don't really, uh, I don't really think beyond that that Putin's too concerned with uh, drawing comparisons uh, with uh, Nagorno-Karabakh as far as Crimea is concerned. Okay, last questions. All right. How can uh, the recent referendum in Crimea affect the non-kinetic war tactics of Armenia, uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, and Azerbaijan? Very good question. So something that we're all witnessing, and I might veer off a little bit, uh, but surely the history books will cover this and uh, more uh, theoretical analysts in the international relations works will be writing articles on this. But what we're witnessing now in Crimea is more or less the, what I would argue, the return to multipolarity of the world system. Uh, so that question why I said it is very good is because the tactics that both the Russians are using and the West, so the United States and the EU, are using, uh, whether it's for or against the referendum and Crimea rejoining Russia or what have you, uh, it's a brilliant display of uh, information warfare. It's a brilliant display of uh, what's supposed to be objective journalism, but twisted with, again, disinformation on both sides. So in that sense, I think uh, it will only uh, inspire both parties, uh, the Armenians in Nagorno-Karabakh, Armenians in Armenia, and the Azerbaijanis, to become more creative in their uh, non-kinetic uh, warfare tactics. And again, tying in with the earlier question about you know, some peace building initiatives, uh, this is just, this question as, as implies, and my thoughts on it are further reason why the parties will not uh, try to ease or get rid of non-kinetic warfare. Uh, again, they signed a ceasefire, not a peace treaty. The war is not over, it's just been halted. So for them to stop any type of warfare, it, it's not rational from either end. As much as we'd hope for, for them to uh, find a solution, um, this, at this point, this is the type of warfare that we're seeing and we will see into the near and midterm future. So thank you again for coming. I uh, appreciate all the questions. And